Okay, wow. We are just hours away from the Starship launch number five. The FAA has finally given SpaceX the green light, and we're set to kick the tires and light the fires at 7 a.m. Central Time on Sunday. Welcome to Over the Horizon. We've got Dr. Scott Walter joining us for this special launch preview. Scott is a mechanical and aerospace engineer and a two-time founder of robotics companies. He's the the goat of all things uh, when it comes to SpaceX launches and our go-to guy. It's such a privilege to have him every single time. He's on the ground at Starbase joining us via his Starlink connection. Welcome, Scott. It is great to have you. This is so exciting. The long wait is finally over, and this is going to be epic. It's going to be a really awe-inspiring launch of the Starship. So tell us exactly why why we all should be so really charged up and excited about this very special launch of Starship. Well, um, I think maybe you don't have to ask me. You might want to ask a lot of these other people you might see around me right now. So uh, I'm here in Boca Chica uh, State Park, and right behind me is the, the Gulf of Mexico. And just a few kilometers off over there is where Milton began, okay? <laughs> Which resulted in me being wow. here up in this, this dune. And uh, so that's to the east. And then if we look a little bit this way, uh, up to the west, there's South Padre Island, which you may or may not be able to see any high rises and condominiums up there, but, but that's about six miles or 10 kilometers away. And there's a little bay uh, just in front of South Padre Island also, an inlet in there. And most of the people will be viewing from there. Tomorrow I'll be viewing from there from Isla Blanca Beach, which is on the south part of the South Padre Island. And again, in the mm -hmm. bay, there will probably be some boats that, that will be out there, some charter boats that will be able to take people, just be a little bit closer. But if you really want to be close, the closest is probably to head south to Mexico. I think they're about three miles away. So usually the best views you see is from a beach that's just a little bit south from here. But, of course, yeah. we can see right now Wow, that. look at that. Yes. That, cool and I think you, can, you should be, now I have the sun directly in the, into, my, uh, into my camera right now. So hopefully I'm, I'm setting up the shot right. So what you should be able to see is you can see, um, I believe, two towers. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yes. That's so we have tower number two. That is yep. almost complete. What does it look like? Um, it looks, you know, a little bit different than the first one. Like, you know, they've learned a little bit of lessons on um, exactly how to do construction. And I think if you right. look a little bit more, I think off to, I think it's, it's more like over my shoulder, you might be able on to see left. where the build site is. Is, so, that, is that the tank farm? Yeah, that's the tank farm. Well, right? we got the, the tank farm and then, oh, wait a minute, so on the other side over there, you should be able to see the build site. So we have the tank farm, right. which is right there, which every now and then lets out a big gulp to uh, let us know that it's it's alive and it's getting ready. So it's alive. Okay, it's alive I think I can see the, the yes, we can see the shot right here right now. So the booster is stocked, and surprisingly, again, I mean, we are seeing that there are a lot of people here walking around, actually walking extremely close. I mean, that that's right about where the property line is, out in those mud flats, uh, to yeah. be able to take these incredible pictures. It's I mean, just think about it. It's 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 you know. One of those things you want to do even more than once in a lifetime to be able to come out here and get this close to a rocket. No one else sure. in the world can you get this close uh, to be able to see a rocket that is a, I mean, not just a rocket. We're talking about the world's largest rocket, 400 feet, taller than a Saturn V, more powerful than a Saturn V. And we are just going to be, you know, within six miles when this takes off. So this is the fifth test flight. What's special and what's different about this flight? And I think yeah. we all know what it is. And that is what's right behind me there. And that are that is the tower with the chopsticks. So I think, yes, oh, they, I should I could become a weatherman someday. Here we go. Except I've got to get the camera around here. So there are these chopsticks which are going to grab the booster when it returns. And we've all seen Falcon Heavy launches and, and Falcon 9 launches. And we've seen the boosters return to the drone ships and drone and to land uh, like over 300 times now. And so what's the big deal? Well, every time they landed, they landed on legs. So they brought the legs right. with them that needed to come down. But legs add mass, which means it's taking away from your payload. So the idea mm -hmm. is let's put the legs on the tower. Those are the chopsticks. And they're going to attempt to yeah. grab this booster in the morning. Now, um, 
So right now they have a very narrow launch window. So um, yesterday they did not have permission to launch yet, but they were pretty sure they were going to get it and they get it this morning. It looks yeah. like the window has tightened up. So right now um, you have to check the time. I think it's uh, like about 512 local time here. We can see the sun is getting low in the sky around seven yeah. o'clock. It's going to set, which means tomorrow morning when the window is yeah. supposed to open up at 7 a.m., uh, the sun will just be starting to rise. Um, but I believe the actual launch window now is between 7.14 a.m. and 7.44. So there's like only a 30-minute window to do it. So the right. sun will be rising at that time. The other thing that's going to be exciting is that when these raptors burn, uh, launch and jump off the pad, all 33 of them, they're only going to burn for a little bit less than two minutes, like a minute and 50 seconds. It's actually about 10 seconds shorter than previous launches. Oh, then it's going to do, yeah, it's going to then do the hot staging. It's going to do boost back burn, and it's going to be back here less than seven minutes after it launched. Okay, so okay. that's like you know you have probably heard the term the seven seven minutes of terror. Well, yes. that's kind of what it's going to be like right now. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. of course there's going to be a second course because after that we have to our focus is going to go to the upper half of the, the, the rocket, the part behind me, the Starship, which you can see the black heat tiles behind us. Yeah. The silver part, that is uh, the super heavy booster. And then we have the Starship on top of that. Is That's going to splash down somewhere in the Indian Ocean again. And this time, we hope it makes it down without tiles falling off and without us wondering whether the flaps are going to work. So they made a lot of changes to this, and they want to be able to test that out. So we're going to have seven minutes of pure excitement. And then... You know, a little bit, a, a chance to catch your breath, and then we're going to be ready to see the second part on the return. And yeah. all that's going to be over in less than an hour because it's not doing a full orbit of the Earth. The idea is, is, is to stay down. So yeah. any, any questions uh, more about the profile and, and what it's like out here? Yeah, I mean, um, I can imagine what it's going to be like. First of all, how, how far away do you think um, you are right now? I would imagine that for safety reasons, um, SpaceX will try and ensure that people are at at least, a, I would say, about four or five kilometers away, if not further. Yes, yes. Now, um, they, they don't, it's up to the Mexican authorities what they do on the Mexican side, but I believe Mexico is less than three miles from here. <laughs> okay. And so they get pretty close. Rocket Ranch is about three miles away. So there are people who are staying at Rocket Ranch. They will be the closest to this whole thing. I think they will be allowed to be there uh, and have some precautions. But everything else, like I said, is at least um, six miles away. Now, normally the exclusion zone, I think, is technically like two point nine miles. If you go to Kennedy, one of the viewing areas there is, is within two point nine miles of it. Uh, that's mm -hmm. cutting across. So you may want to have it out uh, a little bit further. Now, as far as is the distance, um, I'm looking at that, and I'm kind of a bad judge of the distance, but that rocket is 400 feet tall. And I have a feeling if it was to fall over right now, it would like land right in front of me. So I might be yeah. five, 600 feet away from this. This is unprecedented. Wow. Yeah. You can go to Cape Kennedy and you won't get anywhere close Absolutely. to a rocket, you know, yeah. let alone a launch pad when it's empty. You know, when they put a booster out there, no, nah, they're not even going to get any closer. So this is unprecedented. And because I could be a lot closer if you go by the tank farm. Uh, that's where the road is. That's where my car is yeah. parked. My park yeah. is probably my car is in mortal danger right now. If it was to tip over to the north, it would land on my car. <laughs> okay, so Oops. Oops. That, that gives you an idea of how big that thing is, and also yeah. how close you were able to get. But we want to see why you don't want to be this close during a launch. Uh -huh. Do you want to know why you don't want to be this close during a launch? Uh oh! Wow, that. So which which launch is that from? That was IFT one, and okay. you can still find some of the, the concrete pieces around here for mementos. Yeah. They're, they're still all the place you go along and find. Oh, there's another piece. There's another piece. So yeah, right. this this thing here was ejected from over there during that launch, right. and wow. over that doing there's a couple other small pieces. I'm really surprised some you know some good old boys with the pickups haven't come in and pulled this thing out already because this would be a great momento i'll tell you that i know um, i was just about to say that we making those little cups because we, we can see in here it. you know the cell that's wow. kind of you could probably make a coffee table out of that i'm pretty sure <laughs> and uh what you see they're, they're walking along there i'll just take a quick step down there so you know is that right now i am on public property this this is like a national park right. so this this uh this is what's managed by the the, uh, the, the fish and wildlife 
uh, services. And then I can walk up to right about here, and that's about it. And we can see. So they were they managed to actually purchase this property. So uh, the first time I was here, their property line was actually right where, whoa, right where Starship is. Okay, right. Uh, right. where you can see the um, the wall going along there. That was about <laughs> where the property line is. They've now extended it out to here, and as we can see, okay. private property, no trespassing. Those are up there. I see. Um, after the last launch, I came back out here, and most of these signs were still up. Right. Um, a few of them had got knocked over, but most of them were still standing. And as we saw the people that are up there on the mud flats, um, they're also right up on the edge of where it is. Eventually, well, they're they, still standing. So that's a good sign. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was. So. So that's not. I mean, they're they're not really in there with a whole lot of effort. You know, they're just staked <laughs> down in in very soft sand and can be very yeah. easily blown over. And they remained yeah. up. Yeah, so, and I think we remember seeing kind of the shockwave that came from everything else, but they, yes. they survived. And then off in that distance there a little bit more, when you see some of that sandy area, that is part of the wildlife preserve where you're not allowed to walk over there, not because it's SpaceX, but because it's fish and the wildlife, and it's a nesting area. Right. They don't right. want you uh, walking on, on any eggs. So they were looking at that very closely, and I think um, a few eggs were cracked, but, but nothing, you know, really serious despite the fact that you were that close to something and you can just imagine what the sound must be like and the shock wave that yeah. comes from it. That last launch, they used to have the vertical, the, the remnants of the vertical tank farm over there. And they had a couple of those vertical old tanks. Yeah. They didn't have anything in there, they weren't pressurized. And you could see from the launch kind of the beating of that pressure wave as it went over there. And those things looked like the incredible hulk had just gone out there and boom, 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 boom. Hanged on it. So I had some some before and after pictures from being here the day before and the day after showing the vertical tank farm. So, yep, it got beat up a little bit. Yet despite yeah. that, all these signs stayed up. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. I have to say, it is always such a privilege to have you on with us on over the horizon. And I cannot help but ask you what if you're a betting man, what's your bet? I know it might it might not be the best of luck to bet, but I suppose. And, and the reason I ask you this is because the last time around with IFT4, looking at the reports that we've been seeing, they just might have landed the booster within within one centimeter or a couple of centimeters of where they wanted to land it on the water, which is absolutely mind-blowing. That's sort of accurate. You don't measure with GPS because you're out in the middle of the water. You have no idea where you are. There's no landmark to measure. Put the measuring tape down and say, I was within a centimeter of where I wanted to be. That's remarkable. And that is. That, yes. Now, if you remember on that one, um, everyone was wondering how many more launch attempts they'd have to do before they'd catch it. And, right. and let's say the betting markets at that time was to be a couple of more attempts before they'd even think about bringing it in. And right. some people were thinking that if it went well, but but what is is kind of going well that they would might they might attempt it on this particular launch, and because it came down so well, and remember there were some problems coming down, and ironically, if it had come down perfectly, because remember they had a couple of engine outs, yeah, yeah, if it come down perfectly, they might have said maybe we need to do this a second time just just to double check everything it's all right, right. Despite the fact that they had the engines out, they came within one centimeter of where they wanted to be. Yeah. So I yeah. think that meant they got an even higher boost of confidence that what they did is they tested yeah. the, the robustness of the system, that it was able to come down all, all right. So uh, from that, uh, in, in that particular launch, I had the fortune of yeah. actually being on one of those charter boats out on the bay with some SpaceX employees. And they were all fist pumping, and they were like, the next, yeah, we're going to catch it now. They already knew at that moment that they yeah. were going to go for the catch. And yeah. so I think it's very good because, oh, you hear that? That was yeah. a little bit of venting, you know. Oh. Um, yeah. Was, was it, so that's from the tank farm, is it? That was from the tank farm. I don't know if you picked that up or not. You know, maybe my mic is good enough for getting rid of you know echo no, no, cancellation we did, and all we did, that. We did. We did hear a little bit of a hiss there in the background. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And again. Yep. There you yes. go. So yeah, it's a living, breathing organism out there right now uh, <laughs> that we can see. So yeah. going back, I think the odds are greater than fifty percent because okay. they were so confident with what they saw. They've made a lot of upgrades. They were ready to go well over a month ago. Um, you know, at first yeah. they were talking about early August, but actually they weren't quite ready in early August with the chopsticks and everything else. And so that gave them time to make a little bit more. And it's something that um, 
that Felix Strong has pointed out is that everyone makes this big deal about the fact that it doesn't have any legs, okay? Like, well, the legs are there, and the avionics is so good at being able to drop where they want to. They know how to do that, and that's all you need to do is make sure you get it within a centimeter of where you want it to be. And you just have to hope that, you know, your, your engines are robust enough that they come online when they're supposed to and all that goes well. Now, they're not taking chances. My understanding is, is the way it, it works. So it's going to launch. A minute 50 is going to be MECO, which stands for most engine cutoff, not main engine cutoff, because they're cutting okay. up, I think, what, um, 28 of the engines and the three center ones are still on. So most of them are cut off. And then... Then eight seconds after that, the hot staging begins. Right. And then once that separation is done, they're going to do that flip maneuver and then do the boost back. Now, all the right. boost back does is it, it cancels out the horizontal momentum. It's still going up. So when they're trying to turn it around and come back this way, they're not trying to scrub out any of it going up. They're like, hey, gravity will take it down. Not going to worry about that. So they're going up. And that's actually a good thing that they do that because it means they have more time. Right. So they only have to go back at a certain velocity, not at a high velocity, go up, and then it's going to start to fall back down. And they are going to be heading towards the ditch location. So they've got a, some point out there, which no one really knows how far it is. They want to keep it secret, but far enough yeah. away that's not going to have any impacts here on the, on the shore or anything else. And that's yeah. what they're aiming for. And as they come down, if they get all the parameters right, yeah. then they will decide to do the translation over to here. If I understand what you're saying, you're, you're saying that they're going to bring it down and then move it laterally across yes. to the chopsticks. Yes, so yes, that's yes. The yes. Okay. So, so they probably have some buoys already out there, and, and they're already right. making sure no one's near it. So technically, that's the spot they're aiming for. They're coming right. down there, and if something goes wrong, it's definitely guaranteed to land right there. And I'm sure they have the buoys out there to record anything that's going on. Right. Okay, I want... I, I want to pull up this. This is um, one of the clips. The, the, I have two clips from the booster la, la, landing uh, on water the last time around. Let me play the first clip. Um, tell me if you can see this, and I'm going to add it to stage. So this is this is from the live view that we got, and it makes contact, I think, at that point with the water, and it's upright for a couple of seconds, and then it starts tilting over and it's right. down in the water right. so that's one now, view and now here's the second view that i want to play out and you see that there you have the engines relighting and as it comes down it looks as if there's one or maybe two engines that's, that that's, are kind that of right it. exactly exactly right. yet the the onboard control system was able to compensate for that and still bring it yeah. down do a little bit of hover before it fell over and now right. it there was um an explosion at that point that could have been the um the flight termination system because for a couple of reasons um one of them is they wanted that thing to sink they did not want it floating about and so right. it was supposed to go down so they they had to rip a hole in it to make sure it would sink and of course they recovered it uh the past couple of weeks they actually sell, went out there and salvaged it and, and pulled it up uh right. so Evidently, they decided there was valuable engineering data, but for some reason, I wanted to make sure it was really hard for anyone to get that engineering data and not have it just right. accidentally, uh, you know, float away to another country <laughs> or someone else could reverse engineer it. So, yeah. so the idea is it will come down to that, and then we'll start to translate over, and then it has to hit a couple other points. I think there's like three locations that it has to go through, and if it doesn't make it to those with everything being nominal where they want it to be, then they will scrub. But at Correct. one point, but, but it, it, there's a but on, it just, I, I just want to underscore this fact here, and it's important for people, for for the general public that may be tuning into this, and, and it's important for them to understand that despite the problem with the, the couple of engines the last time around, they still managed to get it almost precisely where yes, they wanted yes, it to come yes, down. And yes, that no. is so amazing. And that's what really has given them the confidence. But this time the around confidence is redundancy. Okay. We all know what a red right. is. Right? Right. It's rapid unscheduled disassembly. And right. then I'm making a, uh, a portmanteau out of that 
with redundancy. So you have redundancy, meaning that when something fails, the redundancy kicks in to make sure the system is safe. And that's how all aerospace is done, is you always make sure you have a backup plan for everything. So uh, most engineers uh, obsess themselves more with everything that goes wrong as opposed to what's nominal. <laughs> you know, We know what nominal is, we know you wanna be there, but we're trying to think of what you do when everything starts to be off nominal. So in this case, it's you know it's a very safe plan that we're, if something goes wrong it's going down in the gulf where it's safe and it's okay and then if everything is okay uh, we'll bring it in a little bit further but if something is wrong there then we can automate we can already ditch again and ditch again but at some point there's going to be a point of no return and it's going to come right over my shoulder and it's going to be hovering just above the pad and it's going to be grabbed by the chopsticks and then slowly put back down on the pad and it's going to be a rather amazing moment for everyone when that happens. Um, the, so the I have a couple of questions here. Yes. I, I have a couple of questions here. The first being, considering that this is the first time that you're going to have that massive load coming down onto the chopsticks, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would imagine that they've done everything that yes. uh, was required to test out whether the chopsticks could take that load. The second point is, can do you do you do what do you imagine will happen if there is like an explosion or or uh, an uncontrolled movement laterally when it's at the tower and coming down? Okay, then, then they have a big mess, and they've already had a couple of big messes to clean up after with some of the the earlier uh, um, test launches. If you remember, they came down and all of them just you know pancake belly flopped. Uh, right behind us and there's a little bit of a mess to clean up and that's expected and that sort of slows the program down a little bit because there, there has to be a full accident investigation and everything else before everyone is right. is, is sure and of course they're, right. they're making sure if there is an accident that no one is going to be impacted anyways that's why you have these very large evacuation zones the thing is it's probably um more critical at launch because you have so much fuel Mm -hmm. and, and if something goes wrong at the launch, you are going to have quite a fireball, and that would be catastrophic. When it's coming down, it's near empty, and it's right. probably, you know, maybe a little bit more similar to the amount of fuel that was left over from the initial uh, Starship tests that came down in belly flop. So, um, there, you know, there is concern that that could happen. They believe everything has been fortified because before things were not that fortified. And now, you know, they, they're going right. for the horizontal tank farm and everything else. So that should be pretty well. As far as right. the testing, now the chopsticks, they did some initial tests and I think they found that they needed to um, strengthen some components of it. So that's why it took a little bit longer to get ready. And then last yeah. week, they did this thing with the really big water balloons that they were hanging from. So they, they really put it through. And I'm sure it's beyond whatever the, the safety factor was to say that we know this is the maximum it's going to get. So this yeah. should not I be think, that. I think, I think yeah. Elon had a meme out there uh, with those water balloons as well. On, on yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. And yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, since this is a family friendly, I won't say anything about what those water <laughs> balloons look like. Uh, the, um, but the point the, being, the, Scott, the point being that you have you have behind you a second tower. Yes. Now tell us about that one and how does that come into play if, God forbid, there is an accident of some sort and you have the first tower out of action or damaged, you still can continue development of the Starship program because yes. you've got a What's backup tower in place. Correct. Right. Right. And that backup tower has made a lot of changes from lessons learned on, on the first tower. So mm -hmm. they're not going to be all uh, that upset if something happens to the first tower. Yeah, the second tower, yes. So, you know, hopefully they perfect everything before they really start testing it out on the second tower and uh, have that working. And the, and the other is it will allow them at some point to have a much uh, more rapid pace of launches by having two towers and having a certain amount of redundancy. Now, as far as how heavy it is going to be uh, to grab, we know the chopsticks are, are, or Mechazilla, the whole mechanism is able to lift up both the booster and the Starship and then put them on the pad as well as mount the Starship on top of it. So we know when it's empty, it can do it. Uh, when, it's, when it's fully loaded, that's something else. But it, to remember, when the booster is coming down, it's almost coming to a dead stop. It's, it's not trying to catch it falling. It's coming down and it's hovering and moving over yeah. to the right position. So you don't have to, to worry about sort of the dynamic loading coming down, just the static. And at that point, the boosters are pretty close to empty. 
So um, it's got more than enough margin to be able to take the, the you know the the dry mass of it plus a small fraction of leftover propellant. And now I don't know if they're dumping anything because I believe they have um, one of the tanks actually has a header tank. So potentially right. they they could get rid of everything from the main tank. And the other one, I think the, I think it's the oxygen tank uh, doesn't have a header. So it, you will have some sort of residuals there. So they, they've calculated the fractions down to where they, they want it to be. Um, and now the header tank is used for the final landing. It's, right. it's not going to be used for the reentry burn. It's not going to be used for when they decide uh, to do kind of the translation over to here, if they do something like that. But then at some point, they're running on fumes. And if it comes down, probably a lot of things will break. You'll get um, a small explosion, but you won't get something like when it's, if it was fully loaded. Right, right. So it's as far as everybody who tunes in is concerned, the thing to look out for tomorrow is the booster landing and the chopsticks yes. working for the first time in this situation, correct? Now, what yes. about what about the Starship itself? I know it's almost anticlimactic, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 it's, it's, it's forgetting about that because this seems like it's going to be the main event. But yeah. boy, the sequel is coming right after it. And again, yeah. you'll have enough time to probably relieve yourself, grab a snack, <laughs> call a couple of friends up and say, put this in this live stream right now because this is going to be really, really cool. And, you know, I, I put, um, you know, greater than 50% odds, you were asking earlier, for both the catch and for a really good recovery uh, right. for each of them. And then, of course, maybe 50% uh, on that both of them go successfully. You know? <laughs> That's kind of how it works, right? It's like on, on your over and under. So, you know, um, um, uh, well, and we get some more, yeah, uh, another venting process going on there. It's taking a little bit longer. Uh, okay, so I think I should still, <laughs> you should still be able to hear me. But the other yeah, thing is, yeah. you, know, you think about it, the FAA was saying that it wouldn't be until mid-November yeah. that they would get the launch license. Yet SpaceX yeah. was pushing ahead and pushing ahead anyway. And yeah. during the meantime, there were some congressional hearings about why is this taking so long? And then some pushback right. from the, the, the Vulcan launch the other day, which had an, an anomaly, even though everything went all right, and them yeah. saying, yeah, it's okay, we don't need any investigation. And then yeah. I think a Crew-9 launch where there, everything went fine with that, and there was an anomaly uh, on the second stage reentry, and then suddenly, oh, ground the fleet. And so everyone's scratching their heads, oh, wait a minute. You know, it seems like one person could do no wrong. The other one, you're constantly saying, we want an investigation. There was pressure yeah. being put on them, most likely and from NASA. And rightly so. And rightly so. Yes, because my understanding is at some point, NASA and DOD can go to the FAA and say, you are approving this. Because yeah. both of them, this is very important. So when we look at the Starship, the first thing we think of is like its importance for a mission to Mars, and of course the yeah. missions to the Moon. That if yeah. if if the U.S. wants to get back before China, then the program has to get on track, and we cannot afford to, to keep it being slowed down by what seems yeah. to be bureaucratic red tape. Uh, so, but there's however, also Star Shield. Which is very, very yes, important. Star Shield. And I was going to say, the first mission, the very first mission, is a mission to Earth. And it is both important for Star Shield, for DOD, and also for SpaceX in general, because um, the, the Starlink part of SpaceX is profitable, and their launch yeah. surfaces are profitable. But this is a pretty expensive R&D project, which is being mostly privately funded. Well, people will talk about, yeah, but NASA is giving some money for this. Like, well, that's a little bit. And it's it's a fraction of what is actually going in here from, from private funding and investors who really believe in this dream. So in the meantime, they're able to help subsidize it with uh, Starlink. And, of course, again, going back to what I said earlier, is a little bit out there is where Milton formed. And that was the second major hurricane uh, within two weeks. And the first one yeah. being Helene which hit areas that were completely unprepared for hurricanes because there was no expectation that a hurricane would be so many hundreds of miles inland uh, in an area where everyone was kind of cut off from communication. And, you know, I brought with me here because driving on down here and typically around here, you can easily lose uh, cell phone uh, connectivity. Went ahead oh, and brought the Mini. Mini. The Mini. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I get the, that along here and very easy to set up. 
gives you connectivity anywhere in the world. But the most important thing uh, about Starlink and what happened during uh, Helene is yeah. the FCC, not the FAA, the FCC gave provisional clearance to T-Mobile and to Starlink yeah. to test the direct to sell. So they Correct. put up some test satellites already, which are the version yeah. 1.5s that yeah. can be launched in the Falcon 9. Yeah. And it, it seems like they turned it on, which means you do not need to have something as big as an iPad or laptop in order to have that communication. Anyone has it probably in their pocket already today. So the problem is there's not enough uh, coverage to be able to do the whole world. But eventually, any spot in the world, in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the desert, on the top of a mountain, if you are in trouble, you could just take your cell phone out and ask for help. This is going to be amazing technology to be able to do that. However, you need extremely sensitive antennae to be able to do that. And the antenna that they need for it, for those um, satellites, are just too big to fit in the Falcon 9. Yeah. That and is that's, why that's And here. that's where Starlink Gen 2 satellites come into play. Yes, the Gen 2. Those are the, so it's the 1.5s. They, they made a mini version of it to be able to fit it in there to start testing it. So a lot of the Starlink launches, they have like a half-half kind of a, um, payload deployment with some of the direct to sell. But they had enough that they could test it out in Helene. And that's already showing you the importance of that. So we know about the difficulty of a lot of people getting these systems in there. So yeah. the last time I was down here, I brought my actual Starlink dish because the mini wasn't there yet. A few weeks later, it was available. So that was the state of the art in June to be able to bring it. And the problem is you needed 110 somewhere. So you could get the 110 from like your um, from your Tesla or if you had a, a pickup that you know has, has an outlet in there or something like that. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, that gets a bit tough. You have to bring a battery with you. The mini makes it a little bit easier is that you can use one of those battery packs that a lot of people will use to recharge their cell phones or their laptops. Yeah. And you'll, you'll get about two and a half hours out of it. So in this little string backpack I have, I can go around with it and set this up and yeah. be remote anywhere I want. That's still a little bit inconvenient because sometimes emergencies happen when you least expect it you don't prepare for emergencies you know what three hours from now you know unless of course there's a hurricane is coming in something something happens all of a sudden and you're going to deal with what you have and if yeah. what you have in your pocket is your phone that should be yeah. good enough yeah and i i i, I want to use that as a segue to bring up um a post on linkedin from sanjeev sharma who's um a principal engineer at spacex uh, and he says, in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene and bracing for Milton Down, this was three days back, SpaceX and T-Mobile have enabled direct-to-cell satellite connection that work with existing cell phones. This is the best effort trial since the full constellation needed for this service is not in place yet. And being able to get emergency messages out when all other means of communication are not available can and has been proven to save lives and provide comfort. Hopefully, he says, 2025 will be the last year when even emergency communications need mm -hmm. ground assets to survive a disaster. And that is so, so absolutely vital for everything that we've been seeing, especially in the aftermath of, of both Elaine and Milton. And the manner in which communications breakdowns can just affect something as basic as as rescue work if you yes. i mean if, you, if rescue workers don't know where you are they can't get out to you and help you exactly exactly and you know one of the things that i'm reminded of is uh, before we had this technology before uh you i mean even cell phone coverage is not as extensive as, as you think there was an editor from cnet who uh went um somewhere i think over thanksgiving up, up in the nevada area from the bay area and on the return, they were hit with a snowstorm and they were lost and they were in the middle of nowhere and they could not communicate to anyone. They didn't know how to get out there. And, and like uh, they were stuck in the snow and then they ran out of gas for heating and everything else. And uh, the, the the husband went out to try to get help and unfortunately, you know, died of exposure before the rescue crew was able to get to them. And you just think about that, you know, that kind of technology would have saved them. They had cell phones. The cell phones just didn't work. Um, because there was no towers anywhere nearby where they were. So the, I, the fact that 
again, these freak emergencies, they just happen. Weather suddenly happens, you're caught off guard, you're not expecting it, and you need to rest, get help. And think about, you know, something like that would be, you know, absolutely life-saving. Right. And so a right. lot right. of yeah. lives are going to be saved because of this technology, a lot. Yeah. yeah. And in the light of all of that, you know, when you look at the, the entire con controversy around the FAA's delay, it's a bit difficult to kind of understand why this is happening for for technical reasons, because obviously it seems that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes that perhaps shouldn't be and ought not to be, given the fact that it's so crucial to American security. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, and again, that's where probably the DOD and NASA and a little bit of Congress put some pressure on the FAA to yeah. say, why do we have this ridiculous bureaucratic rule here when it seemed yeah. it had something to do with a hot staging ring um, that they, they wanted, no one quite understood that, that they wanted to make sure that at the impact pack site, it wasn't going to be affecting any fisheries. So, That's right. okay, uh, but things are falling in the ocean all the time from rockets, yeah. you know, off of, uh, of Kennedy Space Center and, and stuff like that. Uh, much larger uh, pieces, by the way, and no one seems to make any bones about that. So, yeah, yeah um, it's, I, I think they're getting the message that it is not a good look to keep slowing progress like this down, yeah. especially when there's a national competition going on on who yeah. is able to return to the moon and what's yeah. going to be vital for that. Yeah. And there are some things that pol politics and politicians stay far away from, especially when it comes to the greater good. And yes. it's, it's not just America here. Starlink is a service that is being offered to the entire world. To the world. It's to the world. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and it has. Remember, there, there have been many disaster situations where Starlink has gone in and helped out. Uh, you know, floods right. in Germany. You know, yeah. just just think about third, you know, a, a first world country, and yet they had a disaster that required Starlink to be able to come in there. Numerous right. hurricanes in Florida in the past where it's helped out. Uh, you also had, I believe, in, in Tongo where the volcanic explosion was. In in other areas, when suddenly something happens, suddenly Starlink is there uh, to right. be able to help out because it's not limited to national boundaries. As a journalist, I covered the, the flash floods in the state of Uttarakhand in India in 2013 um, when there was a, an artificial lake that formed in the in the middle ranges of the Himalayas and that burst and that sent down like, like hundreds of thousands of gallons of water just crushing everything, washing away everything in its path. And the first thing to go is lines of communication and lines of access, the road network, yes. infrastructure. That's the first thing to go. And if you don't have cell phone towers out there, it's it's next to impossible to get in touch and get, a, get an assessment of things on the ground. But if you have satellites up there, up in the sky looking down, it's safe. Your, your, you know? your cell towers can be fine, but if yeah. you don't have power, they're useless. Yeah. <laughs> so, True. I mean, that's all this is some of the infrastructure, and you know, that's, that's what I'm kind of learning uh, coming off of Milton. I wasn't in a rush to come back from We Robot because I can't actually get to my house and stay in there because of all the infrastructure that's been hit for the second time. So, right. you know, there's no water. And part of the reason there's no water, there's no sanitation, is that being at sea level, they need pumps in order for the sanitary system to work. But they don't have electricity right now. Uh, the other thing they don't have because they don't have electricity is the internet. So I think the internet has been compromised for some other reasons, but also without the juice. To run it, it's also not working. So all these things kind of have a cascading effect. I've been able to, you know, I'm one of the, the rare exceptions where I am because I have the solar, the power walls in Starlink that right. I was able to pretty much see live on my ring cameras everything that was going on. I remember, yes. Because I was the only only person with, with internet. <laughs> so, the only person with power and that's yeah. still the state today that right now is that um no one really wants to stay on the island long enough yeah. to be able to do anything like that yeah you you kind of you don't a lot of people don't understand or don't take seriously how how vital this technology is until you really need it and then by mm -hmm. then it's often too late and that's that's the sad part but yes. um just to go back to to tomorrow's um to tomorrow's launch of uh, of Starship, I just want to pull up another uh, post from Sanjeev Sharma. Uh, he has a little caveat here where he says the stage may not elect to attempt a catch if some 
criteria. Under yes, estimate. yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. exactly. And um, so, yeah, he, he's just letting you know that on the way down, they need to make sure it passes a bunch of tests. And if any one of them fails, the same thing with a launch, you know, one thing is off nominal, it's scrubbed. So yeah. we are expecting weather like this tomorrow. Um, I've spoken to some people here that are, are locals and they say, yes, the weather has been clear in the mornings. I like IFT4, which was very foggy. So the expectation yeah. is that if the sun is up and we're hoping it is at 7.14 a.m., uh, they're going to be ready to go. And they have that very narrow launch window until about 7.44. I suspect it got moved to 7.14 maybe because they wanted to make sure they had enough light. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, it makes sense. You want to inspire people yes. to look when the sun's up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, you just see people are still coming. They, they haven't shut it down. I think everyone has probably at midnight they're going to clear it. They, yeah. No one's going to be allowed uh, here after after midnight. Yeah. yeah, right now. So where are you going to be? Where are you going to be watching it from? Um, I'm going to be watching it from South Padre Island, and on the south side of South Padre Island is um, this area called Isla Blanca. Uh, it's a park. You know, there's like a miniature ski to get in. I think the park. I'm not sure if by foot. Um, some some friends uh, last minute got an Airbnb on the island. So we don't have to deal with trying to drive there. We'll, right. we'll be able to get there, stay overnight, get up and walk on down there. And um, there's also a lot of beach on there. It's it's the main viewing site for everyone. There will also be right. people over, I think, at the um, at, uh, something worse. I'm trying to remember what it is. Uh, that's over in is, is La Blanca. Uh, that's another viewing site. I, I think Tim Dodd tends to have his live streams over at yeah. La Blanca. Every day astronaut. Right now, is uh, for you for those of you watching. If yeah. you want to go and check out every day, every day astronaut on YouTube, that's a brilliant yes. channel. Now, now it's, it's brilliant, and the funny thing is, he won't be there, believe it or not, and neither <laughs> yeah. will Felix. But their cameras will, in their crews, so that right. they'll be doing it from a distance because they weren't able to make it because you're not sure. And Ellie is in Europe. So it's like oh, wow. oh, the okay. three big names aren't going to be here for it. So, yes. <laughs> uh, but and, and I, the only reason I came here is that um, I, you know, there's no reason for me to go back to the Tampa area because I'm going right. to be staying in a hotel over there. So I could either stay in a hotel over there or stay in a hotel here until I can get back to my house. So that so I was like, hey, why not? And hey, I'm, I'm hey, lucky, lucky for me, lucky for all yes. the Horizon viewers. And this, it's it's this, always I'm, a privilege to have you. Yeah. yeah. I'm referring to this as my first Gump Week um, <laughs> because, you know, a historic hurricane that I had to deal with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at the same time, the wee robot, which was – you know, uh, which which was told to be like historic, and then this here is clearly going to be historic. So yeah. uh, to be able to like within seven day period sort of experience, you know, all those things at once is something else. I mean, that's, only Forrest Gump got to see that much, right? That I suppose be, there'll be a few Mexicans watching. Oh yeah, I mean that beach is going to be crowded over there. They they, they just absolutely um, they have really the, the best location because it's so close. Uh, and I think it's it's fairly easy to just get in there in park. So it's a, it's a wonderful location, and that does make it really a very international kind of event, which is yeah. which is kind of great. Um, and you know, from here it's about oh, almost a half hour drive before you can kind of get back to the outskirts of uh, of Brownsville. And if you want to get around to, to South Padre Island, you're going to make the big loop. It takes about an hour to get up there. If anyone in your um, in your viewing public happens to be here and sees this. Yeah, I will be on South Padre Island, down around where um, the, the famous Jesus statue is. It's probably there <laughs> is where right. I'll be setting up, unless everyone else is around there. Um, but that's that's like a central location, but it's a pretty big beach and um, should be able to accommodate. It's also a campground, so I'm sure a lot of people are camping there as well. Cool. That sounds so exciting. I'm so happy for you. Uh, Scott, it's uh, I'll let you go because I know you've got a lot to do. You've driven all the way down there. Uh, you need your rest. You need to prepare for tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. It's always such a privilege to talk to you, especially when we're lucky enough to get you on the ground. Thank you so much. Yes, and I hope I can get you tomorrow after the lunch as well. Yes, yes. So I will try. We will be there early. And I, the cell phone connectivity from South Padre Island was horrible because you have like 10,000 people there. And so I'm bringing them in just to make sure, you know, for the backup that we can try to do a couple of live shots 
uh, ahead, ahead of time. Well, thank you so much, Scott. It has been a pleasure, absolute pleasure, as always, and a privilege. Thank you. You're welcome, Roy. Bye, all.